Good afternoon, church. Bwana Sifiwe, praise the Lord. I pray that you're continuing to enjoy your time of fellowship here. Um, whether it is the time of praise and worship, uh, the times that we have conversations with each other, and uh, even when we finally break and go for tea, uh, that's part of what we do here, uh, just part of enjoying community and fellowship and um, reconnecting back with the image of God. I know you were hoping foundations would be one, someone, or two, but we are still at foundations. Unfortunately, when you don't dig the foundations deep enough, the house collapses. And so I hope you appreciate that. There's quite a bit to do uh, in terms of beginnings. And uh, to be honest, uh, very often uh, we always keep to some of the favorite parts of Scripture that we don't think much about uh, or, or that we are more familiar with. But uh, it, it's difficult. Not many times uh, do people spend enough time in the beginning. And I believe that if you don't know what happened in the beginning, then um, you will reach out for solutions that turn into dust or into straw. And you wonder, why, what am I not getting right? But if you get it right at the foundations level, then it is very, very likely that uh, the solutions that we'll seek, that you seek, will be adequate and um, they'll actually bring about the intended um, cure or solution that, that we seek. So far, um, we, we, we looked last week at the final ostracization of the human family from the ideal setting, which was the Garden of Eden. Um, God looked at humanity. He decided you're not well clothed. And uh, so he discarded whatever it is that they had sought as a solution for themselves in terms of fig leaves, aprons of fig leaves around themselves. And he substituted that for a garment of skin, um, which is probably evidence of the first uh, bloodshed, which is those animals that wore those skins initially um, had to die in order for God's righteous requirements to be met. In other words, he had to clothe them with righteousness, something that would cover the sin that they had committed uh, because we learn later on that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And therefore, we know though man sinned and the command had said, on the day that you do this, you shall surely die, they continue to live on for another probably 900 years. Uh, but at that point, something has broken. And so God gives temporary shelter to them in terms of covering their sin with, with, the, um, with the substitution of innocent animals that had done no wrong but now have to give up their life so that those who are image bearers can continue to live. And so we read at the end of chapter 3, um, the Lord God, in verse 21, the Lord God had made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So the fig leaves are discarded. In substitution, they, are, they wear the animal skins. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So again, it's a grace and a mercy that God decides to limit um, humanity's um, longevity. He must not be allowed to reach out from the tree of life and eat and live forever because that would mean living perpetually and forever in a state of fallenness without hope of redemption. So he's excluded from the forever tree, so to speak, and he's limited from access and, 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 and he is chased from the garden as it, as it were, excluded uh, from that place. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Aden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Aden cherubim and a flaming sword of, uh, flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Utterly forbidden, cannot access that without the righteous requirements of God as God works out a permanent solution for the redemption of humanity. So mean, meantime, we are included, excluded, um, banished from the Garden of Eden, excluded from the tree of life. And, and, and sometimes when we um, do funeral services, we normally point people back to Revelations 21 and 22, 
Behold, the dwelling of God is now with man, and he shall live with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And if you go on to chapter 22, there there is the, the river of life that is flowing from the throne of God in the city, and on each side is a tree of life. That's paradise recreated. So garden, the, the Eden experience, paradise will be recreated, but not yet. And at that time, because there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more sin, then we can perpetually live in a state of sinlessness forever with God, but not in this fallen state. Because then that would not be a blessing, it would be a curse. Because we would continue with our struggles perpetually without end. So our banishment and our exclusion from the tree of life is a mercy from God. And, and so he banishes humanity, and we find ourselves now on this other side of Eden. In chapter 4, Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And Cain means to bring forth. Uh, later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. So we have the first humans on record to be born. Up to this point, the humans that exist have been created. So the experience of birth, the experience of conception is yet unknown. And, and, and um, she, uh, Eve acknowledges that now, literally, she's the mother of the living, she's holding a baby. They have never seen a baby before, okay? Because then they came as adults. So a child has never existed. And so this is all the wonder that we know the, of, of, of a birth, you know, holding a child, and, and the wonder that it continues to attract even in everybody, I've never seen a child who's not, I mean, uh, a parent who is not utterly taken uh, aback by the beauty and the, and the miracle uh, of birth. And it continues from this time. And now she's holding a child, and, and she's now becoming the, the mother of the living. It's a beautiful thing. She acknowledges this, that with the help of God. And I think this is something that we need to have in mind, that conception is not just something that we do because we slept with each other, you know? This, with the help of God, God is involved in the creation of humanity. Why? Because these are not just other creatures. We are image bearers. And, and, and God does something special for conception to happen, um, for a child to come to term, for birth to happen. The, obviously, Genesis is silent about very many things. Uh, for example, uh, we know, you know that, that childbirth has, has many challenges. We don't know who midwifed, for example, Eve, okay? Because Adam is clueless. You know, okay, most of us are still clueless. But, but Adam was even more, for genuinely he was clueless. But there probably were conversations uh, that had happened between God and Adam and Eve. After all, he had blessed them and told them multiply and fill the earth. There must have been conversations about what does it mean to multiply? Okay, when you, you have sex with each other, this will happen. Part of my blessing is that you will conceive. There will be a little human being, an image bearer, growing up inside of you, and there must have been instructions. After all, God is a good father, you know, and he takes care of his people. He's, if he's thinking about nurturing them and what he gave instructions about, this is what you will eat, don't eat of that fruit. Do, we, we cannot limit the number of conversations that God must have had with Adam and Eve as the only father present existing for this human family that was coming up from, um, from, from before him. And, and so uh, she, they hold this baby in, in, in their hand, and, and then there is another conception, um, and then another child is born, and, and uh, it's a beautiful thing. They, they name him um, Abel. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel, uh, by now, probably, she's getting a little bit more experience in terms of, you know, um, you know be becoming a mother and, and, and Adam, you know, also becoming a father. But the first conception then uh, happens outside of Aden, uh, on this side of the fall, okay? Now, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Um, without any prompting, 
the children take different lines. One becomes a farmer, the other one becomes a shepherd, you know. The Bible does say bring up the children in the way that they should grow. The Hebrew word is in according to their bend. So it's not just a question of spirituality and, 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 and skill um, or spirituality and discipline. It's also about what they are naturally disposed towards doing. So nobody actually tells Cain, you know, you, farming is good for you, you know. Um, uh, what is it called? Horticulture is very profitable nowadays. You know, there's no such conversation. But he grows naturally towards the plants. And Abel, on the other hand, is inclined towards the animals. And, and so I think it's, it's a point of, to note as parents, because as we bring up different children, they'll have different bends. You know? And it's up to you as a parent, as the authority, that they are growing up under you to discern what your child is gifted in and encourage that. You know, and as we shall see later here, there will be those who will be born, and we are told he was the father of all who play the harp and the flute. The other one is the father of all who make tents and keep animals. The other one is the father of all who make iron and bronze. Those are tendencies. And, and sometimes as parents, we get frustrated. You know, you want to bring up a lawyer or a doctor, but this guy just listens to music, you know? And, and you get frustrated, and you're trying to change their bend towards what you think they should be. There is a, a gifting in there that is dying to come out. And sometimes you fight it until they are old enough to resist you, and then they become what they want, you know? Or they do the degree that you wanted, and then they go and do what, they really, what is really their bend in terms of how, how they, are, um, they are brought up. So we need to exercise discernment. And, and to, to be able to have conversations with God regarding how can I best encourage the potential that you have planted in this child so that they become fully who you wanted them to be. Some of them are excellent, amazing musicians. Can you imagine if, if, if somebody insisted that, you know, Grace Cavesu was to become, what, a lawyer? <laughs> what would be missing out here in terms of worship, you know? Because that's a gifting God has planted in there. Let it come out, you know, and, 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 and let them be the best that they can be. The beauty with you letting the gift come out is that it becomes a blessing to many people. But also they themselves are greatly fulfilled because that's who they are. At the core of their hearts and their being, that's who they are. And as they express this gift inside of them, thousands of us get blessed in the process. So I think we, let's, let's uh, exercise discernment as we bring up our children to know what is the natural bend of a, if he's an abel and he's a keeper of flocks, let them become that. If it's a cane and a man of the soil, let him become that, um, and so on and so forth. But in the course of time, we are told here, um, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And here is the wording that is really important. Okay, some of the fruit from the soil. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flocks. Again, a lot of what we must do here is, is through inferring. There must have been other conversations that are not recorded here. And this is the thing about Genesis, okay? It's a book about theology, not about chronology, you know? Chronology is where you record all the events so that you can correlate them. That's not what the Bible is interested here in. He's telling us a history of our relationship with God, our origins, and enough information to know where we came from and what went wrong and how it can be rectified. Sometimes people get frustrated in trying to take scientific terms and saying, okay, if this happened, then you're looking at cause and effect. But, but this book precedes science by thousands of years. So it's not be, being spoken from a scientific point of view. This is information about from a God who created us. This is the theology. This is my relationship with you. Until the time of Abraham, maybe the early Bronze Age, that's when you can start relating wild events to Scripture. Because then, in, in terms of archaeology and so on, you can go back and relate the time that he lived, um, the kings of that time, the ancient kings, and that's still ancient history. But before Abraham, it's very difficult to put a timeline on which time was this, what was really going on, because there were no other world events being recorded side by side so as to compare, all right? But God is giving us enough information for us to know this is what happened. In some areas, he will not date, but he will talk about particular days as relates to the age of the people on the 16th year or on the 600th year of Noah, this and that happened. But we are not told this is, you know, uh, a certain 
chronological time um, in which this happened. So, so the information there is enough to tell us about what we need to know about what was going on. So the, there are records here that are missing of the conversation between God and Adam and Eve about their parenting and conversations that are missing about God and Adam and Eve to Abel and Cain about, for example, sacrifices and offerings. How did they know how to bring offering? We are not told. Because this is, again, before Exodus. The law has not been given. So God hasn't said, thou shalt bring an offering. But he's a father bringing up a family. So they must have had conversations that every so, and so, every so often, I will expect this of you. Because then we are told, in the course of time, Cain brought an offering to the Lord of some of his crops. Who told him to? Somebody must have told him that you must bring an offering to God. And then, in the course of the same time, Abel brought some fat portions of the first fruit, of the firstborn of his animals. That information must have come from somewhere. Maybe from their parents. Maybe from God. We are not told. Again, what is in focus here is the kind of sacrifice that is brought. And that's the, 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 the gist of the conversation. So here... Um, we, we have Cain br the, the bringing in uh, the, the grain offering, all right? And as he brings grain offering, we know it will not be accepted. It's just some of the grain offering. When we fast forward to what kind of grain offering God was expecting, then we can find fault in what Cain brought. The conversation must have been around the question of the kind of offerings that you should bring if you're a farmer keeping crops. It's found in chapter 26 of Deuteronomy. When you have entered the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance and have taken possession of it and settled in it, take some of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land that the Lord your God is giving you and put them in a basket then go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name and say to the priest in the office at the time. Obviously, this is before the priesthood, but we know what is required is first fruits. Okay? So go to the, um, then go to the place that, the, uh, sorry, uh, and say to the priest dwelling uh, in the office at the time, I declared to you today, to the Lord your God, that I have, um, that I have come to the land that the Lord swore to our forefathers to give us. The priest shall take the basket from your hands and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God. This conversation cannot have happened then because this is before his time. Uh, Adam and, and, and Abraham and the rest have not come into the picture. But he's to take that offering and give it... Um, he says, so the Lord brought us out. Sorry, let me just look, look at where. Place the basket before the Lord your God and bow down before him. And you and the Levites and the aliens among you shall rejoice in all the good things the Lord your God has given you and your household. The acknowledgement is that I'm a farmer, so what is appropriate and, and, uh, for God is for me to bring the first fruits of what it is that I have harvested and present them to the Lord my God. The word fast fruit is missing in, in, in Cain's offering, but it's not missing in Abel's offering. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flocks. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was angry and his face was downcast. So that conversation about what is appropriate before the Lord must have taken place, but Cain chooses not to bring the appropriate um, uh, offering. There's a value judgment on Cain's offering because we read of Abel in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, by faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. He said by faith is not because the law has not been given, so it's not by law, okay? You can't say you've broken a law. But because they know what God requires, by faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous, when God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. 
So he's singled out as righteous because he has done what is right before God, but Cain, on the other hand, is having problems, and, and his problems have to do with anger, and that anger is misdirected. Then listen to God's counsel. Note something. This is very early in our history. So God is personally involved in the lives of these people, not only in the life of, of uh, Adam and Eve, but also in the life of their children, almost like a grandfather stepping in to show the parents how to parent their children. I do that. I'm a grandfather. So, 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 you know, he's very involved personally. And this conversation is between God and, in quote-unquote, the children of, 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 of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are not in the picture. They are still silent. Maybe they are still being parented from afar by God and being shown how to parent their own children. So God steps in. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Not again, something is missing here. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? The conversation of what is right is missing, meaning the information has already been given. You know what is right. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, he says, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. But you must master it. So again, there are no ABCDs that are being given. So there's information that is not included here because already Cain and Abel know what is right. God has already told them. So this is a matter of choice. And at this point, note, God is not looking so much at the sacrifice. He's now looking at the heart of Cain. He says, I don't like the bend of your heart. I don't like the attitude with which you're coming. Now you are angry. Why are you angry? It's a very personal conversation. Why are you angry? And, and you see, it's important to respond to the promptings of God. Today, he still prompts us through the Holy Spirit. Why are you sad? Why are you angry? Um, why, are you, why are you glad? Maybe you're celebrating. Those are expressions that we need to bring to God. And if we choose not to, there are sometimes are catastrophic effects on ourselves. So as God engages you, he's not getting into your space, he's not trying to bother you, he's not crowding you, no. He's, he's seeking to heal you. He knows if you don't talk this thing over with me, it will not be well with you. If you, if you don't offload your burdens, the burdens of your heart, where this thing will lead you, even you will be shocked at where you will end up. So talk to me, he's saying. Talk to me. I'm here. And if you are in a crisis, well, that's, that's why I'm here. Note the level of fellowship. This is the great and mighty God, the creator God. He has downgraded to a level where he's at a human level having conversations with an angry Cain who seems like he wants to throw a tantrum. And God is saying something very important. Cain, focus, focus. The problem is not your brother, okay? The problem is your relationship with me. This is where the issue is. If you can settle this, then that will not be a problem. But if you don't settle this here, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. You must step up and you must master it. And, and I, I want to say this um, because we know this conversation or the ignoring of what God instructs will lead to the first recorded murder. So Cain becomes the first murderer. This was, this was Eve's baby boy, her firstborn. And remember there was a promise, you know, that the seed of the woman shall crush the serpent's head, you'll breathe his heel. Maybe in her heart she had even thought, maybe he's the one who will redeem us. You know, the guy who will crush the serpent's head. After all, he was to be the seed of the woman. She was the only woman then. But because of ignoring some very important conversations with God, it's going to lead him to a road of no return. And his anger will boil to an extent where it has to be, it has to be vented out. And is being vented out on the wrong person because he refused to address it with God. 
And I wonder what questions God has been asking you of late. Why are you angry? Because sometimes we have legitimate reasons to be angry. You lost a job, you lost a loved one, you know, there's grief, there's sorrow, uh, there's anguish, there's tragedy. Things happen. Real reasons why you could be angry. But if you don't address that with a person who is the only one who can take full responsibility, anyone else you try to blame, you can only bring harm to them and to yourself. Does Cain listen? The warning is very clear. Sin is crouching up, you know, it desires to have you, but you must master it. He ignores the sign, he ignores God's call. So Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. It boils off and becomes murder. And this is the basis of Jesus' description when he says that whoever is angry with his brother in the heart has already committed murder. It's where it begins. It's where it begins. And, and so he quits the scene of anger with that of murder. He says, murder doesn't exist of, on its own. It begins at the heart level and at the refusal to address the matters that are causing you to be, to be angry. And, and instead of addressing them with God, he projects to his brother. It becomes jealousy because God has accepted my brother and he hasn't accepted me. And that's not where the issue is. So what questions has God been asking you of late? What is making you angry? What is making you sad? What is making you mad? And what is making you glad? Those are three things that you can address with yourself. What makes you glad? What makes you sad? What makes you mad? Address them before God. He's big enough to take it. And he knows you're blaming him anyway. But you will seek to project it to a weaker person. Sometimes even your loved ones. They take the brunt of your wrath. And this is how violence finds its way into human history. A tragic, tragic story. And, and some of us need to address before God some of those issues that cause us fits of rage and fits of anger that erupt into violence and we do incredible damage to people we are supposed to love and to protect. Because you've never addressed those things honestly before God. And so you project to the weaker vessels around you and you do great harm. And as you do that, you model violence as a way of communication to the great detriment of the family. And people have made professions out of the damage that we have done. Counselors and psychologists and psychiatrists trying to unravel what's going on. Take these things seriously. And if you don't address them, they don't go away. They, they lead to every matter of, of, of complication. Because we are complicated beings. We are created in God's image. So there will be issues of depression, issues of mental illness. All kinds of things. But if you can be unedited before God, because God puts a finger on all these areas of darkness in our lives, but the enemy whispers, these are your issues. Keep them to yourselves. And they boil up within us. And we become walking volcanoes. Waiting to erupt and do incredible damage to ourselves and those around us. Find yourself in the presence of God and go to him unedited. And whatever you'll be telling him will not be breaking news. He already knows it's there. He's just waiting for you. To come up with it. So why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right. And what is right is to go before God unedited. Will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right. 
Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. The secret to mastering life is not that we are more bold or courageous than other people. It's that we know where to take our issues. To a God who defines us, who gives us identity, and who gives us a sense of belonging and a sense of worth. So Cain goes ahead, doesn't listen to God, murders his brother. God comes with the same familiar question, where is your brother Abel? The other question was, where are you? That's what he asked Adam. Now he's asking, where is your brother? I don't know, he replied, am I my brother's keeper? Look at the nerve of it. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer to this is that, yes, you are your brother's keeper. And, and, and today, the greatest commandment that we are told, love the Lord your God, the greatest alienation, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your brother as yourself, your neighbor. You are your brother's keeper. Two of the greatest commands, God himself, our creator, and your fellow image bearer. That's the whole duty. You do those two, you're good to go. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what is this you have done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse. It's the first time that God has cast somebody made in his image. Even in Adam's case, he cast the ground. Not Adam and not Eve. But now for the first time, because of taking of a life, because of murder, God curses Cain directly. Now you're under a curse and driven from the ground which opened up its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. There's a symbiotic relationship, we say, between Adam and the dam. The dam is a dam, is, is, is a blood, and Adam, you know, and the Adama, which is the ground. And one responds to the other. You murder Abel, the ground in empathy opens its mouth to receive that blood. And that blood then cries out to God because God will later say the life is in the blood. That's why he's dead. And there's a calling out of the blood to God, seeking vengeance. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. So look at how self-directed he is. There's no word of remorse. He doesn't apologize. He doesn't repent. Nothing. He just says, this is too much. You can't punish me like this. And then he's afraid for his life. Whoever finds me might kill me. So he's worried about his life, yet he has taken his brother's life. It's a whole new level from the fall of Adam and Eve to the fall of their son, their firstborn, who becomes a murderer and shows no remorse whatsoever. Sin has this way of changing us to something unrecognizable. And unless we can address our matters with God, which includes repentance and seeking of forgiveness, it's the only way that God can restore us back to our sanity and our humanity. And if you do not repent, then you become something else that even you will not be able to recognize. But the Lord said to him, not so, if anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one um, who found him would kill him. God is still being gracious and sparing this guy, despite what he has done, despite his arrogance and his answering back and his refusal to repent. He still protects him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, which means wandering, east of Aden. So a life of total alienation from the presence of God 
um, also alienated and rejected by the ground. Nothing. It will yield nothing for him. Cain lay with his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad was the father of Mehujael, and Mehujael was the father of Methushael, and Methushael was the father of Lamech. Lamech married two women. So polygamy enters into the human family and to the human history for the first time through um, Cain's generations. One, um, one named Ada and the other Zila. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who play the harp and the flute. There you are, the musicians. Zillah also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Naama. Lamech said to his wives, now listen to this, how violence becomes institutionalized into the human family through the line of Cain. Ada and Zillah, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words. You can see this is already constructed into a poem, eh? So you can, you know, what, uh, some of his children would, be, would become poets, so they probably get it from him. Because, I mean, when you're talking to your wives, you just say, you know, you just talk. But him, he has to construct it into a poem. <laughs> I'll try that with my wife. I'm not, I'm not sure how it will go. Uh, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me, if Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. So this is a conversation with his wives. He's even put in poetry. And he's boasting about his violence, that he has murdered a man just for injuring him, a young man for wounding him. And he's saying, I'm willing to do it many times over. You know? And so violence becomes institutionalized into the human family. And, and you can see what started just, I hope you're beginning to, 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 to capture the magnitude of the fall. It wasn't just a fall. This is disaster for humanity. From that little, apparently little disobedience of Adam and Eve, you will not surely die. And choosing to intentionally disobey God's instructions. Look at what their own firstborn son becomes, a murderer. And look at now, five, six generations down the road, they're not just talking casually about murder. Now they think it's something to even boast about and compose songs over. And warn the rest of the world, you dare touch me, you step on my toes, you are so dead. You know? And so I think we need to take seriously the things that we model in our families. What to you might look like, oh, it's just, you know, I just get mad sometimes and strike out. You don't know what generations you're bringing out, and you don't know what that violence will do to generations to come. They could devastate people because you have modeled as right something that God says is wrong. And in years to come, yours might be one of those violent families where people murder each other and kill each other. Brother rises against brother. And this is what the enemy wants. And there must be a place to sober up and say, is it, you must make a statement and say, it stops with me. I will break the cycle of violence or whatever cycle it is that you see and say, it stops with me. Because there's a promise from Christ that whoever is in Christ is a new creation. I can model godliness for my family. I can model love and mercy, and justice for my family. And I can speak authoritatively about sin and evil, about things that we will not allow to continue in this family. And you can do that with authority. Because you can see the devastation that is going to bring in years to come. Adam lay with his wife again in verse 25, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in the place of Abel since Cain killed him. 
Many years later, she's still in mourning. That's why that sentence is including there, included there, because Cain killed him. So in sadness, she still, you know, uh, is mourning Abel's death because, you know, they didn't know what death is. They'd never seen it. They'd only heard about it from the enemy. You will not surely die. But now one of their own sons kills the other, and they look at Abel's life, in lifeless body, lying there. It's the first encounter with death bringing all the sorrow and grief that we know about today, you know? And, and, and so even though she, she has this baby that now she's given birth to, Seth, you know, you can, she's still looking back yeah, because Cain killed him. They had two children. One was killed. The other one was ostracized by God. And so they were childless, in effect, after having two children. The effects of the fall. So now they're starting over again, and now they have Seth. Because of God's mercy, the Bible says, Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. So that's a grandchild. At that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. So that's a glimmer of hope, that there is restoration beginning to happen. The line of Cain ends with violence and a promise of more death. Then God grants um, you know, Eve another child with Adam, who is Seth. The grandchild is Enosh, and around that time, people return again to calling on the name of God. So we are left with a sense of hope that it is not all hopeless, and God will still continue this pattern of seeking the righteous, and through righteous people, raising a family to redeem humanity, and that thread will continue as we look at it. Let me make one comment before we finish today, and... We are, we're not yet at the flood, but fast forward to chapter 9. God is going to destroy the earth because of violence, okay? And he's going to do a recreation, okay? The first was creation. He's going to destroy all conscious life, okay? And after destroying conscious life, just reserve a few and one family only, and then begin afresh. So because nobody else exists, he has to reissue, again, the covenant and the promises, and this is what he says in chapter 9. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, we'll go back to the story in full, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. We're back like to Genesis, because all life has ceased. The fear and the dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground. These are the surviving creatures that will now multiply after they leave the ark. And upon all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. So for the first time, man receives food that be, is beyond the, the, the seed-bearing fruit, fruit trees. Okay, Because up to this point, animals have been, not been given for food. Just as I give you all the green plants, I now give you everything, which includes the animals. Of course, before... The fall, in garden there was no death, so you couldn't kill and eat. But now after the fall, the animals can be killed and they can be eaten. And that's how we get that diet today that some of you Kenyans love dearly. Um, but you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each man too. I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, God made man. So capital punishment, the death sentence, is divinely mandated by God as a way of imputing value on human life that bears the image of God. And he says, if anyone sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Because that's the value. And, and the reason is not because of human rights. No, no, no. It's because man was created in God's image. And no one has authority apart from God to take life. And if you take life, then God says, your life too shall be taken because I created that person in my image. It has far-reaching implications, you know, so that today as we talk about commuting the death sentence, this is a construct of human rights, and, and it's, a, it's a humanistic centered empathy that says, you know, you should not kill another human being. God says, no, 
You don't have that authority. I created man in my image. Somebody takes man's life, his life must be taken. That's God's command. And, 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 and he continues. It's one of those that even in the New Testament, um, that mandate and authority, God commutes it and he gives it to, uh, not to individuals, but to governments. And, and he says there, um, in chapter 13, we know it well, in the book of Romans, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authority that exists have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. So then, capital punishment is a divinely instituted imperative by God based on the value of human life. And that's how God sees it. I pray that you have deep conversations about these things as you agree and disagree with others. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you.